And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Coming up today, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the government will bring in a new law to swiftly exonerate and compensate victims of the post office scandal. It comes as the government have also backed Alan Bates, who campaigned on behalf of those wrongly accused, to be given a knighthood. Full details on the way. Also, a British Navy ship has repelled an attack by Houthi rebels as tensions in the Red Sea escalate. And could an all-out war, therefore, be on the way in the Middle East? And new guidance says rogue social housing landlords could be forced to repair mouldy homes within 24 hours. Rightly so, you might say. Our man Paul Champlina will be here to tell us more. And, of course, it's your call. This show is all about your response and your opinions. We're asking this question. Do you trust our government to sort out the post office scandal lines are now open 0344 499 1000 text 8722 or on the socials it's at talk tv but first let's get the latest news headlines with divya Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak has announced a new law to quash the convictions of hundreds of victims of the post office scandal. Earlier, he told the House of Commons this is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history. The Prime Minister also said he is taking the case seriously after the government had come under increased pressure to take action over the horizon fallout. More than 700 people were prosecuted for accounting errors relying on data from faulty software. The victims must get justice and compensation. Sir Wynne Williams' inquiry is undertaking crucial work to, under, to expose what went wrong, and we've paid almost £150 million in compensation to over 2,500 victims. Uh, but today I can announce that we will introduce new primary legislation to make sure that those convicted as a result of the Horizon scandal are swiftly exonerated and compensated. Meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer has criticised the Prime Minister for his party divisions over the Rwanda plan. Around 40 Conservatives, being led by former Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick, are trying to force changes which they say will strengthen the law and stop people smuggling into the UK via small boats. The Labour leader accused the Prime Minister of being held hostage by his own party. Just like he knows the debt isn't falling and taxes are going up, he knows the Rwanda gimmick won't work. Yes. But he can't be honest about it because he's too scared of his own MPs. Yes. Doesn't he wish he'd stuck to his guns rather than to allow himself to be taken hostage by his own party? A British warship has shot down seven drones that were heading to attack a Royal Navy vessel in the Red Sea. The Defence Secretary says the HMS Diamond, assisted by a US warship, deployed missiles and guns to bring down Iranian-backed Houthi weapons. Grant Shapps has warned it was one of the largest potential attacks yet, but no one on board has been injured. Ecuador's president has declared war on criminal gangs after masked gunmen attacked a television studio. Employees were forced to the floor during a live broadcast of public television channel TC in the city of Guayaquil. At least 10 people have been killed, with President Naboa declaring a 60-day state of emergency after a wave of recent jail riots and escapes from prisons. Donald Trump has tried to dismiss a federal criminal case where he faces charges. He plotted to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Appeal court judges have sharply questioned his argument that former presidents should be entitled to immunity from criminal prosecution. The former chair to the Nevada Republican Party, Amy Tarkanian, told Talk TV it's not surprising to see support for Trump growing. I think really he's, he's done such a good job at claiming victimhood and making sure that his base also understands that if he's not chosen, because he's the only man in, in his view that is the answer to making sure that America is on its right track, he has them so convinced that they too could be in a world of trouble just like he is and that the government will come after you and I if he is not the next president of the United States. And women using HRT are being told not to stop taking it, despite research claiming it can increase the chance of developing rheumatoid arthritis by nearly 50 per cent. Around 400,000 people in the UK have the condition, with women three times more likely to get it than men. Experts say the study uses old data when HRT was synthetic, not natural body identical hormones, which are prescribed now. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gaffer.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's less cold out there this afternoon, but it's also cloudier for the vast majority of the UK. Now, it's due to the fact that we have a change in wind direction, bringing through that less cold airflow, but it's also dragging in quite a bit of moisture of the North Sea and um, forming into clouds. So across uh, central, southern and eastern Scotland, a cloudy afternoon to come, as well as across much of Northern Ireland, particularly towards Belfast, Northern England, north of Wales, later central parts of Wales and the Midlands will also become cloudier. But southern parts of England and Wales continuing with sun sunshine as will the west of Scotland and the west of Northern Ireland but cold across these areas still. Into tonight and we will continue with the cloud across the parts of uh, the north and east and uh, there will still be some dribs and drabs of dri drizzle across these areas too. Elsewhere though it will be mainly dry and clear for western Scotland and southern parts of England and Wales where there will be widespread sharp frost developing. And then through tomorrow we'll continue to see that cloud come in off the North Sea and in fact after a sunny start across parts of the south it will tend to cloud over later although the far southwest probably clinging on to the sunshine once again it will be a very cold day with below average temperatures but slightly higher around eastern areas with a less cold airflow times radio sponsors talk tv weather And good afternoon. So, it's taken the best part of 20 years, but finally it seems we are getting somewhere with the post office scandal. As I previously said on this channel, the wrongly accused must have instant justice for what is the greatest legal travesty that Britain has ever seen. Hard-working people put their hearts and souls into their local post office, only to be wrongly accused of trousering thousands of pounds worth of cash from the tills by a faulty IT system. They're now finally seeing light at the end of the tunnel, but it's not because of those endless campaigns that did it. It's mostly down to this. The computer system post office spent an arm and a leg on is faulty. No one else has ever reported any problems with Horizon. No one. You're responsible for the loss. I haven't got that money and I don't know where it's gone. Yes, a TV drama has woken the nation up to the Horizon scandal. Hundreds of victims saw their personal stories dramatised and laid out in one place for the very first time. Finally, after years of trying to clear their names, it seems like they might be getting somewhere. The post office scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history, shaking people's faith in the principles of equity and fairness that form the core pillars of our legal system. There remains 800 post office convictions based on bad data. Until those convictions are overturned, the victims cannot claim compensation. We can do something good, Mr Speaker, together. Well, as you might have noticed, suddenly every MP is on board. Cries of, I've never seen the like, can be heard coming out of Westminster on an hourly basis. Where were those voices for the last 20 years? But I guess that's politics. Today, it was the turn of the Prime Minister to stamp down his authority. It seems he wants to draw a line under the scandal and not let it get lost in the post again. Today, I can announce that we will introduce new primary legislation to make sure that those convicted as a result of the Horizon scandal are swiftly exonerated and compensated. Yeah. We will also introduce a new upfront payment of £75,000 for the vital GLO group of postmasters. <laughs> and can I thank my honourable friend, the member for Thurscombe Moulton, for all his hard work yeah. on this issue. He will set out more details to the House shortly. We will make sure that the truth comes to light, we right the wrongs of the past, and the victims get the justice they deserve. Yeah. And those words were echoed by the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, who until today also had remained fairly quiet on the scandal. It is a huge injustice. People lost their lives, their liberty and their livelihood, and they've been waiting far too long for the truth for justice and for compensation. So I'm glad the Prime Minister is putting forward a proposal. We will look at the details, and I think it's the job of all of us to make sure that it delivers the justice that is so needed. But here's the thing. Whatever happens now, it will never fully address the crunching levels of life-changing injustice these people suffered. 33 of those postmasters are no longer alive. Four took their own lives. Many still can't even talk about it. Lives really have been ruined. But it does feel like first base. Could this finally be the beginning 
of the end. With all of this in mind, do you trust the government to sort out this crisis? I'd like to take your views on this, that specific question, and the wider issue of what you're making of what has gone wrong here. 0344 499 1000. That is where you'll find us. We'll take comment from you throughout the course of the programme. Joining me now is the assistant editor over there at The Express, Asa Bennett. Afternoon to you, Asa. Happy Good afternoon. New Year. Can you still say that? Just about. Ten, ten days in? The threshold ends now. It's, the, it's, it's now. It's at this very moment. <laughs> the threshold of New Year, New Yearness has finished. If you say it again, it's inappropriate. It's completely inappropriate. Um, um, I mean, let's just have a talk about this. It's been talked about endlessly for the last few days, but not for the last few years or even decades. Hmm. And, and that's what's the most remarkable aspect of this. This has been a scandal decades in the making and in the offing. It seems to have drawn in all sorts of people from across the political spectrum and all sorts of outlets and journalists yep. have been speaking about it, you know, for years. But only now it's taken an ITV drama to really shake people awake and realise something must be done. Suddenly, it, it's cemented in people's minds, you know, who the villains are, there are miscreants galore, and that there are sort of victims who have been hard done by who deserve every little bit of help we can give them. And so, thankfully, the government is taking that decisive action. Um, we've seen that Paula Venels, uh, the former post office yeah. uh, your chief, She's handed back her honours, losing CBE, post office, losing letters, as it were. But, um, yes. you know, sort of... Uh, I wish I'd I, said that. Well, I'm sorry, sorry to say flippant. <laughs> but, um, and <laughs> the thing is, is that... You know, so we've really seen some people pay the price. But the saddest part of it is that, you know, whatever compensation the government manages to afford those who've, you know, been unfairly sort of thrown to the wolves, effectively. Yeah by a soulless, uncaring corporate system, by an IT system, you know, this horizon device. Whatever compensation is possible, it'll never make up for the, the years of torment mm. and torture they've had to suffer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, they can't wind back the clock. We've, we've seen and heard countless stories of, you know, families and people who have not yep. been able to travel because they have to sign criminal records declarations and everything else. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, like, like Alan Bates, who just wants to go on a holiday, finally. There are people who have lives shattered. They have to slowly try and rebuild yeah. them now. Indeed. Uh, one of the issues that does concern some people is whether Parliament should be able to usurp the judiciary. That seems to be fairly central. On the face of it, you know, what's not to like? It's a, a Prime Minister and a government and a, the House of Commons who want to give instant justice to people who've clearly been and demonstrably been victims of miscarriage of justice. However, normally there would be a system for that and you would go through the courts and the courts would exonerate you. You, you go through the process and a judge would say you walk free a, a, an innocent man or woman. Um, the 700 and odd people here, there's quite a lot. They can't, hmm. re it would take years to do it that way. So the other way to do it is for some parliamentary act to wave it through. That bothers some people. I don't know why it bothers some people, because frankly, I mean, some say, well, what if there are some genuine, you know, out of the 700 or there might have been a dozen people who were doing bad things? So what? I mean, hmm. so what, frankly, in the wake of this scandal? Does that really matter? It's one of those of greater good moral quandaries yeah, you have yeah. to weigh up. Um, and at the same time, we have to remember Parliament is sovereign. If MPs, you know, they're debating legislation, for example, that, to make Rwanda, they recognise it as safe um, for a destination. That's obviously a different topic. But the point is, when Parliament passes legislation, yes, it could make MPs work with the courts. The courts recognise this. And so if they are then passing it, setting up schemes for people to put in claims to have been victims of the scheme, yep. then they deserve to be heard and they deserve to have swift action. You mentioned Rwanda there. Mm. Uh, let's move on to that. Rishi's rebel army, as they are now known. Uh, I think there's about 40 Tories uh, that have got their eyes on voting for rebel amendments to toughen up the Rwanda bill. Is this going to ultimately make a difference? I mean, it's, it's one of those issues, isn't it? Wherever, whichever way Rishi Sunak turns. Yes. There's somebody wants to give him a bit more, another kick in the shins wherever he goes. You can really see discipline breaking down in Just some corners bit. of the Tory party, yes, because they, they all want to have the Rwanda bill reshaped in their image. Yep. So the Prime Minister's been very clear that this is as far as he'll go. And interestingly, the One Nation group, the head of the One Nation group, Damien Green, he's been going around telling media that the PM looked him in the eye and said he would go no further. Indeed, Mr Sunak has said that uh, Rwanda, the government themselves, they've said that if it goes further, then they will pull out. And you, obviously, you can't, you can't have a Rwanda scheme deporting people to Rwanda if Rwanda doesn't play ball. Um, yes. So all this on one side. And then you have Robert Jenrick, the former immigration minister, saying it's not tough enough, it's not hard enough, and this constituency of 40 MPs. So it's such a painful and tricky tightrope for yeah. Mr Sunak to have to try and sort of meet and, and really balance himself on. 
you do fear that at some point it's going to snap. Um, that yes, he's got through before Christmas the second reading. They agree on the principle that this is something that must be done. But now we're going to have weeks where, well, do you remember the Brexit guerrilla warfare, the amendments and all those yes, sort of shenanigans? Yeah, yeah. Every yeah. week a new amendment and all sorts of uh, arguments galore. You're going to have a mini version of this, I think. And at the same time, the PM knows he, he will be remembered, he'll be made or broken if, and on how much he's willing to be the Prime Minister who gets Rwanda done. And do you think, I mean, you mentioned those factions within the party. There's always been splits within parties, and, and the, the Tories have had a bit of a PhD in it over the years. Um, you've got the, the Genrics and the, the Krugers who have one view, and then, as you say, Damien Green, and which are, there's probably more of the Damien Greens, maybe. Numerically, yes. But numerically. However, the loud voices or the famous faces often come from the other side of that, and they're not insignificant. Who's going to win the day? I think it's... It, 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 frankly, it's a, it's a real... It's a question of who wants to blink first. It's a question of who's, who's all bluff and who's all talk no trousers. Um, we've seen the, those on the right, the sort of five families, as they're called. You yeah. know, they've threatened all sorts in response to previous legislation. They've held their... their fight, you know, they've kept their powder dry time and time again. And so I think, they, I think they know this is the moment they have to try and make themselves heard and felt. Um, otherwise, you know, the One Nation group, who you know, some would call sensible, others in the party will call wets, you know, yeah. liberal Democrats in blue clothing, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. They, they, otherwise, they'll feel they will run rampant. And I think you have to remember at the same time, you know, just step back for a second and look at the big picture. Some Tory members will think that if they're going to be destined to lose. You know, Danny Kruger, reports have shown, he's told people in private that he fears the party will be obliterated at the next election. You may well think then you might as well stick to your principles, stick to your guns and actually mm. do things rather than fudge your way to defeat. Yeah. But I wonder whether, you know, if, if the Krugerans, as we can call them now, were not there, uh, w w would, would Rishi Sunak do better or worse? I mean, that's the the $64,000 question. Hmm. Where are most of the public? Who's, whose side are they mostly in tune with? Well, it's a fascinating question, because obviously, I'd say two quick points. One, we will have seen countless reports about how Rishi Sunak as Chancellor was very sceptical about the yep. Rwanda scheme at first, and may have even, during the Tory leadership contest, weighed up the idea of ditching it. And mm. now, actually, at PMQs, I think when he uh, railed at Keir Starmer on the importance of having an effective deterrent and strong yeah. immigration schemes, he didn't to my ear, he didn't mention Rwanda by name. He just spoke broadly about yeah, Albanians yeah. and all sorts of other initiatives, yep. as if assuming you're just dialing down the importance of the scheme. Um, partly because Keir Starmer was, was relentlessly mocking him and accusing him of not really believing in it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's the thing where, you look, when you look at the polling, what people really s seem to be showing uh, is that they doubt whether the Rwanda scheme will work. But to be honest, they're fed up of constant dither and delay, sure. promises that are not met, and they just want change. They want yeah. to show that if you are going to take back control of your borders post-Brexit, they want to see what that means in practice. And yeah. that's why so many of them, when they're asked, they want to see numbers going down, they want to see more of that sense of grip, yeah. rather than just, what's that, record numbers going up again and again, you know, and uh, just a sense of you know, where, where are numbers heading next. I do think it's a rare moment where I think Keir Starmer that might be right, though. I've never thought that Rwanda is really in Rishi's DNA in that philosophical sense. Well, he said he wants to stop the boats. Get it he said he wants spring. to stop the boats. Well, yes, good luck with that, I think, the phrase, as the phrase goes. Uh, listen, Asa, we hit the clock. Thank you. Good to see you. Always a pleasure. It always goes too fast as well. Asa Bennett, assistant editor here over there at The Express with us here on Talk TV. Now, coming up after the break, more on the Prime Minister's announcement that the government will quash the convictions of hundreds of sub-postmasters caught up in the post office scandal. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. 
COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. You are with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Now at PMQs this afternoon, the Prime Minister told MPs that the government is finalising a new law to overturn the convictions and compensate the hundreds of sub-postmasters caught up in the Horizon scandal. Today I can announce that we will introduce new primary legislation to make sure that those convicted as a result of the Horizon scandal are swiftly exonerated and compensated. Yeah. We will also introduce a new upfront payment of £75,000 for the vital GLO group of postmasters. <laughs> and can I thank my honourable friend, the member for Thurscombe Moulton, for all his hard work yeah. on this issue. He will set out more details to the House shortly. We will make sure that the truth comes to light. We right the wrongs of the past and the victims get the justice they deserve. Yeah. Well, all postmasters seeking to claim for exoneration and compensation will have to sign a statement confirming they are innocent. Post Office Minister Kevin Hollenrake has since said, uh, has since said the spotlight is also on those responsible for the scandal. Former Post Office CEO Paula Venels agreed to hand back her CBE yesterday. And today, the chief architect of the botched Horizon IT system has been dropped as a director of a charity. And Talk TV can exclusively reveal that the former Fujitsu employee Gareth Jenkins has been forced to step down as the treasurer for Homestart Bracknell Forest, following public outrage of the scandal. Joining me now is former Post Office Minister Paul Scully and Maria Spears, who's one of the victims of this scandal. I mean, we'll speak to you in a second, Maria, but Paul, firstly, um, just give us your response to the Prime Minister's comments today in Parliament. Yeah, I'm, re I'm really pleased that we've got to this stage. It is only a stage we've got to get the detail and then get the uh, legislation through Parliament. But, you know, you'll probably hear from Maria and others uh, as you speak to them that their trust has gone with courts, with post office, with, with even government uh, and the like. So it's all about doing stuff. And frankly, we, we keep talking about we want people to approach us and get their appeal done. I think actually we should be doing the opposite. We need to go out to them because, uh, as I say, there's so many people triggered that I want nothing to do with the courts. So the easier we can make it, get their um, convictions quashed, get the money to them, 
then we can start concentrating on getting the answers once we've restored some semblance of order yeah. of people's broken lives. Is this still going to be work in progress, though, Paulie? I, I mean, I can imagine that everything Mr Sunak said, I, I'm sure most people would say, well, thank goodness, we agree with that. The leader of the opposition seems to agree with that as well. Uh, but there will be some people who say, well, this might not actually cover me. I, I, you know, I'm not one of the people that will be uh, entitled to sign any form. So still work in progress, perhaps. Well, we haven't seen the bill. So um, what, what has happened is literally been two days since Kevin said he, Kevin Hollenrake, the minister, said he was going to be uh, uh, looking at this with the Lord Chancellor. They've been working on, on different options beforehand, uh, but they had to speak to the judiciary, senior judges, because it is constitutionally difficult, but this is extraordinary situation. So the idea is that anybody that has got conviction uh, based on Horizon should be able to sign a form, which then you can sort of come back to if there are people that are caught up, as you said in your introduction, that uh, clearly had nothing to do with this and, and were banged to rights guilty. But inevitably, it's going to lead to some people who were being, who were defrauding the post office, getting uh, exonerated, but it's worth doing that to make sure that everybody with that, those, those 900 odd people with convictions can get to the compensation and get restoration. But this will be, it's not gonna be long because Kevin said he wants the compensation to be out and paid by August. Uh, let's speak with Maria. Uh, Maria Spears, uh, you're right front and centre of all of this. We'll come to your story in just a second. Just br briefly give us though a response to what you heard the prime minister say today. Um, as much as it's welcomed, I don't think it's anywhere near enough for what people have actually gone through. I think these people deserve a lot more than what's been put on the table today. 21 years ago, my goodness, you went through this. Uh, I mean, this is how long it's taken. And here we are several prime ministers later. Uh, goodness knows how many elections. I don't know how many ministers have been in various positions in that time. But here we are with, I said at the beginning, maybe this is the beginning of the end. Uh, is that sort of how it might feel? Um, it's, it's, it's a good start. You know what has been said today in Parliament, but I, I really don't think, you know, £75,000, you know, is... It's going to put anybody back into a position that they should be in if this scandal hadn't have happened. Yeah, well, it was three three it's... grand a year in your case, right? Yeah. Which is n nothing. I mean, it, well, not even that. You know, it, I mean, it just doesn't touch the sides really. In terms of your own story, just take us back to two thousand and three, Maria. Yeah, so that's when we started having issues with our post office. Um, we started having losses. Um, these happened right up until uh, 2010 when I had my contract terminated um, in the July of 2010. By that time, we'd paid back in excess of about £30,000. Wow. And then I lost my job, my home and... and so you, you were doing what, uh, and you probably didn't know it at the time, but we all know it now, what hundreds of others were having to do because of the the nature of the contract you felt a responsibility to make up the shortfall right we had to we had to put it in we had to put our own money to make their tills balance what did you think was when you were tallying this up i'm, I'm sure it didn't all happen just in one go but you know where there were days when there was seismic you know the figures were just out so much what well, what were you thinking had happened? Because you must have known. You hadn't, I don't know, the intricacies of running a desk there at the post office, but I can imagine, you know, have you lost uh, 10,000 stamps? Have you, you know, is something else gone on? Have you, you know, did you, for, did you drop a, 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 an envelope of someone's deposit for something? You must have been racking your brains thinking, hang on, I, I can't think tangibly where I've physically lost this money, but the computer says I have. Yeah, so... At the end of our balancing week, which was on a Wednesday, that is when we'd uh, do the bulk of our accountants there. Eh? You know, we do it daily, but on, on a Wednesday, that was our balancing day. And, you know, I used to sit in there till, till the early hours of the morning with receipts going over and over and over, counting, thinking, it's you know, it's got to be here somewhere. And... 
there was just no way to find where the figures were getting thrown out of the system and yeah. what the figures were actually there. They, yeah, nothing ever, ever added up. It just, yeah, I mean, I sent myself a little bit crazy thinking, well, it must be me. It must be me that's, you know, doing something wrong, you know, putting, you know, figures in wrong somewhere. And, you know, we all know now it, yeah. it wasn't any one of us. You know, I'm one of the 555 and we know it wasn't us. It was, you know, it was that sure. system. That did now, it. you didn't get prosecuted, am I right in saying, because the money had gone back. But you, I mean, you, that the, you'd want, surely you'd want the money back as well as any compensation. Yeah, yeah. There's, you know... The money that we put in, it's you know, there's, there's a lot of things. It wasn't just the money that we actually put in; it was the losses that we made as well, having to sell the business, um, the loss of earnings. You know, I haven't been able to earn, you know, the wage that I had in the post office since you know 2010. Yeah. Um. So it's for, you know, 14 years. It's it's a long time, and it's you know it's reputational as well as anything else. I'm sure you know th yeah. there would have been people around who, you know, weren't that pleasant to you as a result of this. And you know you lost your business. You're the heart of the community when you're running a a, a post office, as we all know. Uh, who doesn't like a post office? As I, I said yesterday on the program, you know that they are you know very intrinsic parts of our lives. And you know to go through this, I, I really hope uh, that you know this is just the first part of whatever settlement is able to be reached. And on that point, Paul Scully, I mean, you know, we, we touched on it when we spoke a moment ago. Uh, th there's going to be lots of additional circumstances, right? This isn't a one-size-fits-all story. Not everybody had an identical experience. The numbers differ wildly. And the, uh, the, the, the kind of damage that was done also differs to different people. Yeah, totally. Look, I was speaking at the beginning about getting rid of the convictions, but then you've got the whole uh, uh, situation about uh, restoration. It's not just compensation. It's really trying to restore. You, they need life-changing money. You've heard from Maria, uh, her situation. People are in different circumstances. This is on top of the albeit meagre compensation that they received at the, at the Greek group litigation, because a lot of that obviously went to the legal funders that funded that court ca um, case, which is why they're in such a poor position compared to some of the other postmasters in this. But what Maria and others need is not just a little nod and just um, a little bit of compensation. They've gone through so much. They need proper life-changing money, and that's what I'll be working with Kevin Jones, with Lord Arthur and other people who've been campaigning on this way, way longer yeah. than me. Yeah. working on this for to get that restoration uh, let's hope so uh paul as ever thank you for your time paul scully mp and also maria lots of luck maria um i hope this really does pan out and very very quickly as well maria spears who was one of the victims of the post office scandal with us on the program now nick wallace the journalist who's been at the heart of the post office scandal seeking truth and justice for postmasters is going to be presenting a special edition of prime time tonight giving you unparalleled perspectives on the story. I first interviewed... I've known Nick for a number of years, um, and he was doing diligent work on this when nobody was even talking about it. We had him on the programme here at Talk at the time, and uh, jaws were hitting the ground as he told a story that nobody had ever heard of. This was half a decade ago. And he was talking about how no one's really listening to this. It's, it's very strange. No one, there's, there's not a lot being said. A few column inches here and there, private eye did a little bit, but really not very much. And I said to Nick at the time, this should be front page news every day, and it will be one day. Um, and I think he knew that, and instinctively and brilliant journalism, he just carried on. He was a dog with a bone territory, as any good journalist should be. Uh, he didn't let it go, he carried on, he, he put it together as a podcast, he wrote about it wherever he could, he published uh, the work that he'd done as well, and he's here tonight on Talk TV, 7pm, it's a special edition of Primetime, Nick Wallace hosts, do not be missing it. Now, UK and US warships have repelled the latest or the largest attack yet by Yemen's Houthi rebels on shipping in the Red Sea, shooting down a barrage of drones and missiles. The Iran-backed Iran group launched at least 21 projectiles overnight, with HMS Diamond destroying seven of the Houthi drones. Defence Secretary Grant Shapps confirmed there were no injuries or damage reported. Tensions continue to rise over the attacks in one of the world's busiest shipping lanes with leaders concerned about the impact on supply chains 
and goods prices. Let's speak with Philip Ingram, former senior military intelligence officer. Uh, Philip, afternoon to you. A lot of people will be going, hang on, Houthi rebels, what does this mean? Who are they? What's the significance? Uh, in Janet and John style, if you can, Philip, just break this down for us. OK, simply, the Houthi rebels are an Iranian-backed group that are fighting against the um, legitimate government uh, in Yemen in a, a proxy war that's effectively between Saudi Arabia, who's backing the uh, Yemeni, uh, the Yemeni government, um, and Iran, who are backing the Houthis. Now, the Houthis have decided to um, have a bit of a stand against Israel's war against Hamas, um, even though they're, they are thousands of kilometres away and not geographically linked to Israel or to the Gaza Strip in any way, um, and have decided that what they want to do is attack Israel and attack international shipping using the Red Sea. Now, the Red Sea connects up to the Suez Canal. 15% of global trade goes through the Suez Canal, 12% of global oil, 10% of global liquefied natural gas. So it is a critical route um, for international shipping to use. The only alternative route is to go around the Cape of Good Hope around South Africa, which adds 10 to 14 days and thousands of miles, therefore millions of pounds to ships that have to take that transit and will affect the logistic planning for manufacturers and an awful lot more across the whole of the, the, whole of the world. Yeah, indeed. And, and Gaza and everything plays a, a part in all of this with allegiances in, in different places. This could get a whole lot worse then before it gets better, Philip. It could do. Um, and the threat from the Houthis meant that there's an international coalition of 12 nations have put ships into the Red Sea to try and protect um, international freedom of navigation through the area. Um, and uh, um, th those 12 nations, three of them have been intercepting um, Houthi uh, cruise missiles, anti-ship ballistic missiles and one-way attack drones. And that's the US, the UK and France have so far um, intercepted them. Uh, on different occasions. Um, and it shows just how well the international community works together. But uh, we've heard um, threats from you know, U US uh, officials, UK um, Secretary, uh, um, Minister of Defence and others saying to the Houthis beforehand, this is your final warning. At my count, they've had two or three final warnings so far. And I think the attack last night um, has to be the final, final warning. And what we're likely to see now are actions aimed at directly attacking where the Houthis are launching these missiles um, and the, uh, and boats from as well. They're, they're, they're attacking using boats um, in, into the Red Sea. Uh, and we'll see some attacks against Houthi positions uh, actually inside Yemen. Yeah, and you've hit the nail on the head there. I was going to say British warships don't fire off missiles uh, willy-nilly and for no good reason. So this really is uh, very serious stuff and it, it doesn't happen exactly on a daily basis, right? Well, it, it's happening fairly close to a daily basis at the moment um, and it, it's extremely serious stuff. Of course, it's all pushing to um, you indicate Iran trying to grow what's happening between Israel and Hamas into a much wider regional conflict. And that's why we're seeing alongside the Houthis attacking shipping and attacking into Israel, we're seeing Iranian-backed rebels in Iraq and Syria attacking U.S. interests. And we're seeing the Iranian-backed Lebanese Hezbollah in southern Lebanon attacking into northern Israel. Um, and the Israelis are um, defending that robustly. So the whole region is a tinderbox at the moment. And that's why we've got so many Western military assets. And it's not just Western, it's Western and Middle Eastern military assets poised to try and deter Iran and deter the Houthis. But it, the deterrence isn't working. So the next stage has to be some form of uh, military action. Indeed. Philip, thank you for your time as ever. Philip Ingram with us here on Talk TV. Now, I'm joined by our very own Mike Graham. Uh, to give us a little... I was about to say, you actually walked in about half an hour ago, it seems. I've been here ages. <coughs> I mean, <clears throat> I was going to talk about the Hooties. You diligently took a nice seat there. I did. And Because uh, I've only ever heard of Hootie and the Blowfish, uh, which is a band, a band. Uh, formed in the 80s in uh, yeah, Columbia, yeah. South Carolina. There you go. Very good. I Go Blind is their number one That's song. That's great. It's um, like having Paul Gambaccini sing. Exactly right. So um, <laughs> I had a good chance to look up the name of the song because I'd forgotten what it was. <laughs> so, yeah, Hootie and the Blowfish, great band. Great band, yeah. indeed. And uh, you don't need to fire any missiles at them either. Uh, here we are with day... What are we, day three? Day three. Day three. Yeah, of the uh, brand new, the brand new as I call it. Of Mike I was quite blown away, actually. It's amazing, isn't it? I was, I was there on... Um, 
Uh, and I notice over the back there, there's a special lot out the yeah. back of this studio. Yes. Where they built your studio. They did, absolutely and right. They, they, it's, it's a very different feel. It's, it's a, a very different, different vibe. look. You know, we've yep. got some, uh, some beverages uh, which we drink at the end of the show. We're trying to work on getting that sort of into the show. I was going to say, because I saw where it, you know, you, you've got this nice, nice sort of decanter. Decanter. Yeah, decanter. Very nice cut glass crystal. Yes. Yeah. Got it from uh, the range, I think. <laughs> you know, Is that where couldn't it was afford from? Fortnum and Mason's. Do you know what it reminded me of when I saw that decanter? <laughs> every, in the 1970s and 80s, every sitcom, for yeah. some reason, that they always had... I don't know whether, what they thought their audience was at the yeah. time, and you know, people came home mm. and poured a glass of port yes. or sherry or something. Yes. But it was always... Whether it was Terry it was and June like or... It was a bit you know, like that. You know, my parents never used to really drink much until we all went to college. Yeah. And then we all started drinking wine. But, you know, they would sort of have an occasional glass of scotch yeah, or yeah. something. And that was all they had. It wasn't sort of, you know, turbo drinking bottles of wine from 6 o'clock till midnight, which is what it became. True. But the know. decanter was only decanter, ever seen yeah. on sitcoms and the generation game on yes. the conveyor belt. Yes. And then Dave Allen, of course, had his glass of scotch. Dave Allen always which had is his glass. Uh, one for those who probably aren't quite as old Indeed, as one for the kids. Then. But the idea yeah. is to try and create a sort of a vibe, a bit like sort of an American talk show. Yeah, yeah. Where, you know, I asked for a band as well. We didn't quite reach that one, but we'll, we, we're still going for that. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think And, and you know, we're, we're basically taking all of the big stories of the day. Yep. Uh, sometimes we'll have the odd special. We've got a special tonight, actually, about working from home. It's a new report out, Department of Transport. Are you coming in for that? Uh, I will be coming in, and I expect everybody else to be watching it <laughs> from their workplace. From the indeed. At, yeah. at 10 o'clock at yeah, night, yeah. you know. Um, because it proves that still loads and loads of people are not coming in. You'll yeah. be amazed at how far down... You'll know this from travelling on the train. Train figures for people, numbers of people travelling by yeah. train, have absolutely fallen off a cliff. Partly, I think, because people just can't rely on it. It's incredible. And even when people are coming in, they're not coming in for as many days. No. So the, the, the car park near my station mm. is completely... I mean, it's it holds about 1,000 cars. Right. Uh, Friday and a Monday, nothing there. Nothing at all. There's like maybe 50 cars yeah. in there. Because right. nobody's going... They're picking those two days because yes. you get a massive long weekend. So you assume nobody's buying season tickets either now, because why, they can't be you, why would you? You can't buy a two-day-a-week two season ticket. No, exactly. Ticket. So they're a waste of time. But even on the... I mean, the amount of times I've sat on a train and the ticket inspector has come and sat next to me, yeah. or opposite me. Just for someone to talk to. Yeah, he's because you're the only person on the train. <laughs> I mean, literally the only person it's on the train. ridiculous, isn't it? And yet the train companies are all still making money yeah. somehow. Um, the, uh, the reunions are all still, you know, sort of agitating for more yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet there's no business model to prove that they should be getting any more money. No. So they should be getting less money, actually. In fact, well, it, in fact the new say. offer they should make to Mick Lynch and the RMT yeah. is actually less money. Less money, Because yeah. there's less to do. Yeah, yeah. We'll run they... fewer trains. Um, you won't have to work for many hours, so we'll cut your pay in half. I was that? looking at one of the ticket offices recently that had about four people yeah. sitting in thing. And apart from the fact there's automated machines... Yes. So nobody was going to the ticket office. Don't do it. I mean, one or, one or two Luddites that, yeah. that can't work a machine. Well, they're there in case of any incidents. <clears throat> in case of any incidents. Right. And I thought, well, why, why have we got... I mean, it's the 21st century. Mm. I don't know why we've got a ticket office. No. There, really. I know it's helpful once in a while and a visible presence might reassure right. some people. I'm afraid you can't run the world like they that. They can't, no. They keep saying, well, we need these for people who can't use the machines. Yeah. Really? Exactly. We can't just buy one on the train. Anyway, so, so there's loads going on tonight. And what, what I love about it, and I've always loved about your shows, you know, we, we, we've worked together for a number of years, so, you know, I've, I've always been familiar with what you do and how you do it, but it is a case of, you know, you, you don't have to... You know, one of the many reasons why the BBC are falling mm. out of its own circumstances, yeah. uh, because it, it doesn't know its audience, no. it doesn't know what it's doing, no. it doesn't know what direction to take. It's not... You and I say this all the time, every time we bump into each other, which is a lot... We, it's not rocket science. No. It's about, you know, delivering... They don't engage with anybody, do they? Engaging with people, yeah. having interesting news, doing mm. it in an interesting way, having great guests on yeah. who've got lots to say. Yes, and the occasional row, which, and is, the occasional which is good. Row. But, but not manufactured rows. I don't like those. I like to have proper rows with people, which are generally spontaneous. Yeah. You know, some shows, you, you look at them and you go, they've just done this to have a row, yeah. and it doesn't work. So no. we don't do it like that. No, no, none of that going on. But it is back tonight at 9 o'clock, the it Independent is. Republic of Mike Graham, the all-new look to that show. Cheers, Mike. Thank you very much. See you soon. Coming up after the break, landlords will have to fix emergency hazards in 24 hours under new proposals. That and more property market news coming next. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? 
we do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Now, landlords will have to fix emergency housing hazards like mould and damp within 24 hours under government proposals. The measures are part of a consultation on legislation named after two-year-old Awab Ishak, who, had di who died in 2020 from a respiratory condition caused by prolonged exposure to mould in his home. Joining me this to discuss, joining me on this to discuss this, along with many more other housing and market news, property expert Paul Champlina, who regularly helps us out with this kind of stuff. Afternoon to you, Afternoon. Paul. Afternoon. Good to see you. I mean, we were just saying during the break, I find it unbelievable that this is... Every time one of these stories come up, we've talked about them before, you know, mould or damp, you'd have thought, well, that's it, game... Of, if you're a landlord and you're pushing out property that hasn't addressed this, whether that landlord happens to be the local authority, which is sometimes the case, um, or private, whatever it is, I mean, you should have everything thrown at you and you should have to deal with this within 24 hours. Well, we, 24 months, if at all. It's in the private sector. So we have the Renters Reform Bill that's coming about, uh, you know, safer property and safer yeah. housing uh, and bringing it up to a decent home standard. Now, this is about social landlords having uh, accountability. This poor child died, uh, as you said, in December 2020 due to mould. Um, and uh, there's been a campaign to make sure that social landlords have a responsibility. So it will mean that they, that you have to deal with a complaint within 14 days and that carry out, works will be carried out in seven days, and if it's an emergency, 24 hours. Social landlords, and I, I will say it, and I'll, 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 pin, I'll put a pin to my chest, I think that the social properties in the social sector are worse than the private rental sector. Yeah. I've said that all along. I mean, some yeah. of these stats I've got for you here, Ian, there's 4 million households in the social housing sector. In the last 12 months alone, 30% of social tenants were thinking about making a complaint. Uh, and the complaints... Um, uh, there's actually 14% 
of complainants uh, that did actually make complaints actually complained to their local MP. It was that bad. Wow. I mean, it's horrendous uh, what's happened. So, I mean, you know, landlords get prosecuted. Yep. Should social landlords get prosecuted? I mean, there's uh, the, the biggest uh, housing provider is Clarion, and they've just been, uh, they've had to pay out thousands in compensations by the housing ombudsman because yeah. they haven't dealt with, comp with uh, complaints and repairs. That's unbelievable, right? I mean, it's, we are it, talking... It's not as if we haven't had... I mean, this the, the story of young Awab is a... It's, it's, a it's, it's horrific. It's, I mean, the 21st shocking. century, the United Kingdom, somebody's dying because they're inhaling mould in their house. I mean, how do we get there for well, God's I sake? mean, that, that, was, uh, that was in Rochdale. I mean, what happens was they would have made so many complaints. You have housing associations yeah. and you have councils. We know that a lot of councils have gone bankrupt, mm -hmm. so there's been loads of cuts. Yep. We know that the council properties are older yep. and obviously new bills when it comes to the private rental sector. Um, and, of course, a lot of these social tenants that are making complaints, it falls on deaf ears and it must sure. be really, really stressful. Especially if you've got children. And that, it got to such an extreme case that the government are now changing the law. Yeah. Uh, let's move to some brighter news. We hope it's brighter news. Mortgages. Uh, are, are we seeing... A, is there a turn in the housing market? What is happening here? It, There is some good news, Ian. I mean, look... This time last year, inflation was 10.1%. Yep. It's now 3.4%. That's amazing, yep. right? Which means that interest rates are, are, are from uh, a lot of the, uh, the providers are going to be cut. So um, I know that Barclays have now made a, a suggestion on a two-year that, that, that it's going to come down to 3.75%. Santander doing five-year deals at 3.8%. It's coming down below 4%, which is good news. I mean... Yep. If you think about it, in two years, we had 14 rises, which was unprecedented. Sure. So uh, it's looking good. And there is, there is, there is murmurings that there may be uh, an interest rate cut in May this year. So it means that there's going to be more money in our pockets, especially if you're a homeowner. Yeah, it's going to be tricky. What about with landlords, though? Because landlords... Uh, don't get the same rates. Uh, they have different rates. Are they coming down in that sector as well? They are coming down a little bit in the sector. I mean, obviously, the brunt of the, the interest rate hike with regard to mortgages, tenants bore the brunt of that as well because, of course, landlords have got to pay... All of a sudden, they've been in a fixed-term mortgage, maybe at 2%. Yep. It's come out of uh, an available, and it's gone to 6%. That's a massive, massive jump. Yeah, which and is a, why some have lost their property. Well, that's why, that, and that's why a lot of landlords end up selling. And, of, yeah, course, of course, not and tenants might have been great tenants, yep. but they've been served notice to leave. And then it, yeah, it's yeah. a real knock and effect. But hopefully there's been some positive news for 2024. Indeed. Um, final one here as well. Uh, head of research at Hamptons International has said the government should take a stake in the rental market to fix the affordable housing crisis. Yeah, so what this lady has mentioned, it's, it's, it's quite a maverick idea, actually, a bit like what they've suggested with the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Don't invest in oil, invest in property. So this really relates to a fund uh, relating to why don't the government... I mean, it's great on paper, but obviously, yeah, you know, yeah. the, putting it into practicality, why don't the government buy new builds, new build properties from developers, OK, and actually make sure those properties are rented out to young generational people that are struggling, um, obviously, to get right. on the rental ladder alone because, of course, rents are, yeah, are yeah. sky high. That sounds like something that Jeremy Corbyn might have been in love with. What, can you imagine a Conservative government, even though they might only have about half an hour left in office? Yeah, correct. Can you imagine the Tories would go for that? Would Michael Gove and the like look I at that? I don't think anything... I think it's a great idea on paper. Yeah. And, of course, we have uh, a rental stock crisis, we have a social housing crisis, we have a temporary accommodation crisis. Yeah. We have a housing crisis overall. True. Um, and, of course... Uh, but rents are coming down, so that is good news for renters. There it is. Uh, we're out of time, Paul. Always good to see it. It goes too quickly, it goes too but quickly. Paul is back with us in a couple of weeks as well. Paul Champlina with us here on the programme. We're going to go to the phones as well and get some opinion from you on the big stories. Remember, the lines are open. It's 0344 499 1000. You can text us uh, 87222, starting your message with the word talk, or, of course, we're on the socials at Talk TV. Uh, let's kick off with John in Derbyshire, uh, who's on the line. How are you doing, John? Good afternoon, Ian. Good afternoon Thank to you. What are you thinking? Well, with all the light that's being shone on the poor postal workers, uh, news is coming through. And just from a colleague of yours, I heard a story about a lady called Seema who was 
jailed under Director of Public Prosecutions yep. in around 2008. And uh, she was jailed whilst pregnant. Yes. And Starmer, I believe, received a knighthood whilst he was Director of Public Prosecutions at this time. And he's forever raising it in Parliament that when he was Director of Public Prosecutions, everything was perfect. And it appears from the <laughs> light that it was. And even if, look, I, I wanted to believe Keir Starmer at that time probably didn't know anything about a specific case because he was the head, you know, far too senior maybe to be involved in specifics. But you're absolutely right. The idea that somebody who was eight months pregnant, I mean, goodness me, we see stories of people who've committed the most horrendous offences and don't go to jail. Uh, so it's a fair point as well. Thank you for that. Thank you for starting us off. Let's get a quick word in from Julia in Tilbury, uh, who's in Essex. How are you doing, Julia? Uh, good afternoon. Good, Fine. Good afternoon to you. We've not got long, but I'm sure you can do it. What are you, what's your point? Right, it's about the Horizon scandal. Yep. I think the government, first off, should pardon all them postmasters and postmistresses. Yep. Then they should make the post office pay them back the money that the post office stole off those victims. Correct. Act of theft. And then they should sort out compensation for them. Yep. They should investigate the top people in the post office. Correct. And they should also investigate the investigators that went to those spot on masters. spot on who should have because... seen what was glaringly obvious but they didn't listen yeah. thank you it's a great point i want to see people in courtrooms over this and i think you do too you thank are. you for that sadly we've come to the end of the show thank you for tuning in join me again same time tomorrow that's about three o'clock in real money up next it's vanessa feltz on talk tv have a good afternoon Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to use the XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a 